can everybody hear me? Thank you. All right, let's get started. So, hey everyone, this is the SIGOF Deep Dive for KubeCon NA 2023. Uh, so this year we're gonna focus pretty heavily on Cell and our usage of it in SIGOF. So I'm Mo from Microsoft, I'm one of the leads for SIGOF. I'm Jordan Liggett, also a lead for SIGOF from Google. All right, so we're gonna mix it up this year. So normally we wait till the end to do this, but this year we're gonna do it at the beginning. Uh, so I see Anish, I see you in the audience there. Uh, thank you very much for all your contributions this year. Uh, to here, I know you're not here. Hopefully you're watching this. Uh, thank you also. Uh, I don't think I saw James, maybe if he's here, uh, but also thank you for your contributions. Nilek, I know you're not here, but hopefully you'll watch this uh, and say, yeah. Nebrun, I hope you were here. I know you're here at the conference, but uh, thank you also for all the work you did. Uh, Rita, I know you're hopefully gonna watch this afterwards, and thank you for all your hard work. And Ting, I know you're not here, but we very much appreciate your contributions. I'm gonna go over some of the stuff we did generically in um, We 129 before we sort of deep dive more into the cell stuff. So there was like six high level things we worked on. Uh, Cam SV2 went GA and 129, so yay, it's over. Um, <laughs> uh, Cluster Trust Bundle just landed in alpha, so like I know I see some cert manager folks here. I hope that they will adopt it at some point. Um, we made some great improvements to bound service account tokens. They can contain node references as alpha in V129. James helped with that. Uh, uh, we've made a bunch of improvements to Auten and Auth Z that we'll talk about in detail, and we are continuing possibly the longest journey of any single thing, which is the reduction of secret space service account tokens. All right, so you've heard probably people in various sessions talking about Cell. Uh, what is it? If you're unfamiliar with it, it stands for Common Expression Language. Um, it's a non-Turing complete language and it's designed to be pretty intuitive to read and write uh, with a heavy focus on being able to bound execution time, run quickly, run in performance critical paths, uh, and be able to limit the amount of memory and CPU that's used. Um, here's a, just an example of what it might look like. Uh, it's pretty natural syntax. You sort of have dot accessors to, to fields. Um, there's the ability to have macros or functions that the integrator provides to the expression so that the person who's writing the expression can make use of, but doesn't actually have the ability to define and do like crazy dangerous things. Um, so why, why did we settle on cell? We, we started this uh, exploration a couple years ago uh, on the SIG API machinery side, and uh, we looked at a lot of different sort of extensibility languages, things like uh, Rego and JavaScript and Lua and Wasm. Uh, and none of them really hit all the points that we needed. Uh, it had to be really, really lightweight. Some of those were not lightweight. We had to be able to ensure that the expressions had a bounded cost. So Cell does that by limiting the complexity, but also uh, allowing us to compute the cost uh, at compile time, so we can just not allow expressions that would be too expensive. Um, this was especially important for Cell use in areas that were API facing, where sort of end users or maybe less trusted users were the ones providing the expressions. Uh, so we, because that was the first place where we were using Cell in Kubernetes, uh, it was critical to get that right. Um, another benefit of Cell, we can do really, really deep uh, type checking integration. So uh, rather than just sort of accepting a blob and then at runtime, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, uh, we can actually do that checking at the beginning and tell you when you're starting up or loading the, uh, the expressions, this is gonna work well, this isn't gonna work well. Uh, and then as we've used Cell in more and more places in Kubernetes, uh, we have the ability to customize what the expressions have access to in terms of variables and functions and macros and helpers for each, uh, each specific use. So here's just some of the places that outside of SIGOT Cell is being used. Uh, we won't go into them too deeply because these have been covered in the API machinery deep dive, and I think at least one other talk from CC covered these. But I just wanna highlight one thing, which is all of these use cases are either directly um, or indirectly related to the usage of Cell in REST APIs. Whereas the next two things we're gonna talk about are usage of Cell in a file-based config that's passed to the API server. 
So uh, this went alpha in v129. There's a lot of improvements that we made overall to how OIDC can be configured in this cap. But I want to really narrow our focus on the aspects of this that are related to cell and how cell improved this. So there's a lot of advanced uses that you can imagine where you want a full-blown authentication webhook. But there's a, there can be significant problems when your webhook is down and just the maintenance costs of having such an integration point. So we wanted to see how far we could let people get by just having static configuration on the API server, right? That kind of means you have to make some hard choices, right? So you have to sort of define what kind of tokens you're gonna accept and what they mean, right? So if you had an opaque token, there's really nothing you could do with something like cell because there's no way to like interpret that without making like a database query or something, right? We're not gonna hand you like network access in the cell environment, right? That kind of goes against what we wanna be able to do there. But if you limit yourself to something like JOTS, that means you have a mechanism for understanding how you can verify a payload, you have a mechanism for key distribution, which is basically OIDC style discovery. Now you've constrained the input in a way that cell can really help you. So let's walk through an example. So on the top left there, you can see the exploded like payload from a JSON web token, right? It's just a JSON object, and you can kind of see the claims that are available. So as we talked about earlier, you can define a custom environment, right? So where you see the cell expression that claims variable maps to that object at the top that you can see, right? And now you can kind of start seeing what things you can do, right? So it just so happens that this user's IDP emits a string that happens to be a concatenation of basically their group membership. Previously, you would have to write some kind of authentication webhook to sort of explode this information out. Now you can just use uh, cell functions, split that out, and in this example, we've purposely injected a static group into the list as well. You can imagine how you would use that, for example, if you want every user from your IDP to belong to a particular group, so that way you can assign policy to them. Right? Another one of the things that the authentication config will let you do is just have as many of these authenticators as you want. Right? So you can kind of mix and match how all these configs work out for you. Uh, so as we kind of walk through, the username is going to uh, just be statically suffixed with this external user, and we're also going to take the audience from the token and put it in an extra field, right? Now this means that if you had like an admission webhook or admission cell policy, you can make decisions based off of that if you wanted to, right? So for example, if your IDP encodes in the token that the user logged in with 2FA, you can make decisions based off of that, right? You might not allow any action in Cube system from a user that didn't log in with 2FA or something like that, right? Uh, and we can keep going and take this further. Uh, it is unlikely that your corporate IDP has a concept of like Kubernetes system users, right? It probably does not have any concept of a Kubernetes service account or a Kubernetes kubelet. And so a user info validation cell expression basically lets you say, I never expect that to happen and you can sort of constrain that down, right? So this one is basically saying, hey, if for any reason I ever see a user that has a system colon prefix in their name, just flat out reject the authentication. Um, this example doesn't cover it, but you can actually do the same exact thing with the claim payload as well. So you can say that, hey, if the user is not in like a particular group, they can't authenticate at all, right? So in Kubernetes, if you authenticate, you get a baseline level of access. Like for example, you can hit discovery and get all the metadata about the cluster, right? That's not great if you know that that user has no business being in that environment, right? So, you know, sometimes your IDP lets you configure these things. Other times the IDP could configure it, but you don't happen to have access to that. That's a different team. And you just want to manage your Kubernetes environment. Now you can do that. No webhooks necessary. So that was the, the set of authentication configuration that we've added more flexibility to. In 129, we also worked on uh, expanding what you could do with authorization config. Uh, so again, previously, uh, the way you would configure authorization, you would just pass command line flags and say, here are the modes I want. I want node authorization and RBAC authorization and maybe webhook authorization. Uh, and then if you said you wanted a webhook authorizer, you had to give it a kube config file to tell it where to talk to the webhook authorizer. Um, it's a lot of flags, not super intuitive. Uh, 
And a lot of people came to us and said, you know, I've, I've got one webhook authorization integration off to some, you know, IAM system. Uh, but I actually have a second one I want to run locally to maybe do some deny rules or something. I, I want to run two webhooks. Uh, and, you know, the, the system we had only lets you configure one. You start trying to add multiple versions of webhooks via command line flags, it just kind of becomes a mess. Uh, and so uh, we, we added the ability in 129 to have uh, a config file that lays out exactly what authorizers you want. And you can have more than one webhook authorizer. You can order them the way you want. Uh, when you do that, some questions come up, right? Webhooks tend to be slow. They tend to be less reliable than the authorizers that are built in. And so as soon as we start talking about running more than one of these, we have some, some questions, some goals. Can we limit the blast radius uh, of these webhooks, right? Can we, if we know that the, the local one we're gonna run that has some deny opinions, if we know that it only cares about requests shaped a certain way, can we avoid sending other requests to that webhook? Avoid paying the latency cost, avoid paying the, the reliability cost. Uh, and then finally, some, some users want to host authorization webhooks on the cluster, and so right away you've got a cycle problem, right? If the, if the authorization webhook is gonna maybe make uh, certain requests not be able to be authorized, what about the requests to make the pods to run the webhook that's making the authorization decisions, right? It's easy to get into cycles and problems like that. So uh, in addition to just being able to express having multiple webhooks, um, we added the ability to exclude certain requests from going to webhooks based on something called match conditions. Uh, for those of you who have seen match conditions on admission webhooks that API Machinery did, this is a very similar concept. We followed the same approach, uh, but this is in a file-based config. So we're gonna, we're gonna demo that now. We'll see, uh, see if the demo works. And while Jordan gets that going, just as a reminder, admission webhooks run on mutating requests. Authorization webhooks run on every request. So it's an excellent way to brick your cluster if you do it wrong. All right. So what I have here, I've got a little status dashboard showing three types of clients. On the top here, I've got a load balancer that's poking at my health Z endpoint. All right, this thing may or may not be authenticated. It just wants to know, is this server good so I can include it in the load balancer? Then I've got a, a system controller. This is a cube system service account. Um, it does really important things. If we disrupt it, bad things are gonna happen. This is sort of a stand-in for every system controller that exists in Kubernetes. And then down here, I've got my demo client, right? This is, this is the thing that maybe I want to authorize in a different way or you know, put some safeguards around. Uh, and so this is what the authorization configuration looks like in 129. So to start, I just have you know, the node authorizer and the RBAC authorizer, pretty standard setup. Um, if I enable a webhook authorizer at the end, uh, first of all, uh, dynamic reload, not in 129, but coming in 130. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty great. You can change your config without restarting your API server. Um, now I've got a webhook at the end. And so you notice a few things. First of all, it is now authorizing my demo client. So that's cool. Uh, you'll notice the latency is higher for the demo client. Right, but not for the system clients. That's because these are being authorized by the, the RBAC rules, and so they don't even make it to the webhook. But I am paying a little bit of a latency cost on my demo client. That's okay. Uh, some other things that you see here, you can actually customize the timeout and customize the failure policy. Like if I hit, hit an error with this webhook, what, what should happen? Uh, previously, the timeout <laughs> defaulted to 30 seconds, which is really bad. And the failure policy just continued on in the authorizer chain, which might not be so bad, but if you're wanting to put deny rules in, um, you actually probably want it to, to hard fail. All right, so now we've got a setup where, you know, I've got my webhook at the end, that's fine. But what if we wanted to have some deny stuff? Maybe we don't want anything outside the system controllers messing with cube system namespace. Well, to do that, we have to put maybe another webhook, a, a local webhook that knows about deny stuff up at the top. Uh, so let's, uh, Let's do that real quick. Uh, 
So I'm just gonna do this part to start. All right, so <clears throat> now I've got a deny webhook up at the top, and you see right away, like I'm paying latency cost on everything now, okay? Uh, I'm actually double paying it <laughs> on my demo client. Uh, so everything just got slower across the system, so that's not ideal. Um, but that's not even the worst thing that could happen, right? Like, this is when the webhook is working well. If it's, what if I get errors from it, right? Okay, my deny webhook just went down and I've just completely toasted my cluster. You know, the load balancer thinks it's unhealthy, the system controllers are broken, everything is broken. Um, so what we really wanna do is scope down this webhook to only requests that we know we might want to deny. And so we're gonna, uh, add a few match conditions. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're only gonna pay attention to resource requests. We don't care about, this, this deny webhook doesn't care about non-resource requests like discovery or health Z or metrics, okay? So we made that decision. So right away, our load balancer isn't impacted at all if this webhook goes away. Uh, the second thing we wanna do, this is only, in our use case, we're only caring about protecting cube system, okay? So, we're only gonna pay attention to requests inside Cube system. Everything else doesn't even touch this webhook. Okay, so uh, now my system controllers are happy in other namespaces. Uh, that's good, we're not playing, paying latency costs there. That's good. Um, but we still have Cube system broken, so that's obviously not good. And so the last thing we're gonna do is we're going to exempt system service accounts from even being intercepted by this webhook. And so once we do that, um, my load balancer is happy, my system service accounts are happy. Uh, my non-system service accounts are totally fine in other namespaces, right? The only thing that would be impacted by an error if this webhook was completely available, uh, completely unavailable, is the clients I was trying to deny anyway inside the namespace I was trying to deny anyway. And so that one's still hitting an error, but uh, you know, when we fix the webhook and that is actually working uh, properly, now it, you know, it can get the forbidden error we want uh, but we've really, really scoped down the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. That makes me so happy. <laughs> when people say, I want to run multiple webhooks, and I say, why would you put yourself in that position? With this, we actually have a tool to make that a reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, demo gods. <laughs> um, couple notes on that. Uh, automatic reload is not in 129. Uh, for 129, you just start up your server and this config you start with, that's what you get. Uh, but automatic reload will be in 130 before it goes to beta. All right. Um, if you have questions about any of the cell stuff or any of the other stuff that we talked about or did this release or stuff that's coming up, I want, wanted to let you know how to get in touch with us. Um, that's a link to the community page for SIG Auth. Um, we have bi-weekly meetings, we have a mailing list, we have a uh, Slack channel. Uh, we're very friendly, we promise. Uh, if you have questions or have ideas or want to help with uh, the progression of some of these things, please come join us, participate, give your feedback, give your thoughts. Uh, yeah, so with that, we have some time. I wanted to open it up for questions about this or any of the other stuff we talked about. There's a microphone there, I think, if you wanna line up if you have questions. Thank you. So a lot of the stuff we talked about is alpha, so please go play with it and give us feedback because we can still fix it. Yeah. Once, it once it's beta, then, I mean, we can fix it with permanent tech debt. Uh, the question was about, uh, like, wh wh what's the motivation for the restrictions on cell execution and, and resource consumption? It wasn't nearly as specific as, like, hard, spe specific hardware. Uh, it's just the knowledge that, you know, the person operating the Cube API server, uh, providing the hardware, the resources for that, is not always the same person that's, you know, uh, populating cell expressions via the API. 
And so uh, we needed to be able to prevent abuse, essentially. Um, for something like what we talked about here, where it's actually config files for the API server, abuse is not really as much of a concern, but it is still a critical path you know, execution. And so where it might be, it might be acceptable to pay like milliseconds of latency going out to a webhook, when you're talking about the conditions that are gonna be evaluated to avoid going down that path, you really want like nanoseconds to microseconds. And so that's, that's where cell fits. Um, for authenticating out to a, an authorization webhook. Um, we don't have that planned right now, but we structured the config file so that there's a spot for it if we get there. So the initial connection type, uh, there are actually two connection types. There's you know, run in cluster, so this is if you're running inside a pod and you're like, delegating back to the main kube API server for people running extension API servers. The second connection type is here's my kube config file. So the first goal was really to get parity with what we already had from the command lines, but um, we have a spot for additional connection information styles in the future. Yeah, I, I really wanted what you asked for, but like there was a separate kept that had tried to do it a couple of years back that didn't really make progress, and it, it, was, it was probably gonna prevent this kept from progressing if we tried to solve that problem at the same time. So yeah. I listened to Jordan basically and said just- We try to be it. incremental and actually deliver some things and, yeah. then, and then build those out, yeah. yeah. Yes? Okay, so with regards to driving down to 18,000 when you reference an author or a uh, authentic webhook, uh, presumably to uh, establish a client that the, whether you use HTTP 1 or HTTP 2, HTTP 2 is not uh, currently under the control of this config. Um, the client that it builds will actually try to use HTTP 2. So it, it will try to keep connections open to it, uh, but that's not part of the control there. Yeah, it, no, not at all. Yeah, the, the client that's constructed, when you load the config and say, I'm gonna be talking out to a webhook, it creates a client, that same client gets reused this is just sort of putting conditions in front, so sometimes we don't even call the client. Yeah, now, like, the one caveat there is, like, when your config will change, then your clients are gonna get recycled. Yep. So, but that doesn't happen often. Thank you for going to the mic. <laughs> I've got kind of a beginner uh, cell question for you. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys, like, bind, it seems like cell fields are sort of dynamically generated on the context in which the cell is running. Can you yes. talk a little bit about how you bind or, like, validate that, like, the, the field that you're operating on actually exists and like, I mean, or just maybe give me a resource, uh, you know, a guide on where to find resources for that. Well, let, me, let me take the start of that. So I'm gonna back up, right? So it's situational specific, right? So if you look at, uh, for example, the username expression where it's doing claims.username, we have absolutely no idea what's in your claims because your Jot has no known schema to Kubernetes and there's no way for you to tell us what the schema is. Right, so that is a runtime check, and the runtime check will basically make sure that that cell expression returns a string, right? Uh, and if it doesn't, it's gonna error out. So if it for some reason returned an integer or the claims that username wasn't there, uh, it's gonna fail. Uh, but for example, in the user info validation on the right side, that user info object is a Kubernetes internal well-known schema object. So if you tried to type in user info.foo, your API server is not gonna start because it's like there's no foo field on that. So, uh, so we basically try to do the absolute best we can with the schema that we know, um, but on things like arbitrary payloads, we can't help you there. Now, uh, Cell does have the question mark operator, so it has like optionals. So you can write Cell expressions that can optionally pull in information uh, depending on like if you think it's gonna be there or not, right? So you, you can be as, restrictive or as open as you want um, in those expressions. Um, there, but, uh, go ahead, sorry. No, no I, was, I was gonna say thank you. <laughs> there, there's two steps to um, 
using cell internally, there's a compile step, type checking step, and then there's an evaluation step. And so for things where we know the schema, the compile step will actually catch any errors where you're using a string where it's actually an int or using a field that doesn't exist. For dynamic things like the claims, like Mo mentioned, it's, it's all runtime. Gotcha, thanks. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. So the, the things that you have access to are the token, if you're doing token authentication, uh, and then uh, request attributes. So source IP is not included in request attributes yet, but if it's included in the token itself, then you could map that into extra information and that would be visible to the uh, authorizer. Yeah, so what, what you might want to do, instead of saying that I'm gonna encode like source IP into the token, you, you could, instead encode like the concept of like internal network or uh, like as I mentioned, like something like 2FA, right? Like some claim that uh, gives you the sense of, okay, I trust this client in a, in a different way than I normally do. So when they're gonna do like, uh, you know, maybe they're gonna exec into a production pod, right? Sometimes you have to do that. And, but you still might wanna, I see you laughing, Jordan, sometimes you do. <laughs> um, and so you could constrain it that way, but yes, that, that is totally possible. I saw a hand over here. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, cell is just evaluates expressions, and the variables that the expression has access to are entirely up to the integrator. So in this case, for the claim mappings, uh, the inputs we we provide it a map of string to anything, you know, anything uh, based on the claims in the token. For the validation rules, the input variable is a user object that has really well-known fields. So it's entirely up to us, as we integrate Cell into different, uh, different aspects of the server, what the variables are that it has access to, what the schema of those variables are. And we try really hard to make the schema match the same types you would be dealing with if you were using a webhook. So for, um, so for the authorization uh, rules, the object that you have access to is a subject access review schema. It's the same object you would be dealing with if we actually sent it out to your webhook. Uh, for admission webhook conditions, the object that the cell expressions have access to is an admission review object. So it's the same object your webhook would see if we ended up sending it out to your webhook. We try to make the schemas sort of align between the cell expressions and the integration of that area. Yeah. Um, API machinery has the ability to run cell expressions in validating condition. So this is the uh, uh, 3488. Eight. Three, um, and it's very generic. It, it basically is running cell on an admission review. So you can do anything you want to do from the information in an admission object. So if, if you want to talk meta, so cell for admission control has access to a function which lets you invoke the authorizer. And that authorizer, you can ask it any question you want, which then might flow into your webhook that we just configured, right? Um, so yes, you can go as far as you want. Uh, Turtles all the way down. Yes. Yeah, just, just be careful, right? If you end up making like seven authorization calls. You can't, we don't let you. So this, this goes back to the cost. Oh, right, right, right. The cost uh, aspect. One of the great things about Cell is we can be very specific in like attributing cost to different parts of the expression. So when you're working with data, we, the cost is based on the function you're calling or the macro you're calling and the size of the data. For something like the authorizer uh, function that we make available um, to admission cell expressions, uh, we actually give that a really high 
cost. So you, I think you can basically only do two calls. Okay. Um, just because that could be going out to webhooks. Like it's, it's a pretty expensive call. Um, so the cost is actually done at compile time. So when you are setting up your admission rules, if you tried to create a validating admission policy and you, your rules were too expensive, you wouldn't be allowed to create that API object. Yeah, so it'll just yeah. fail before you can create it. So. Yeah. And, then, and then there are additional uh, protections at runtime. So you know, if, if something unexpected happens, you know, we, we thought you fit within the cost parameters, but then at runtime you're actually going long. There's, a, there's also like a context cancellation uh, mechanism. So we can keep the server from running away with, with costs. All right, well, thank you for coming. We'll hang out here for a few minutes. Appreciate it.